Um, thanks for having me today. I, I'm really um, glad to see this all come together. Um, just to touch on a little bit of my experience um, in the past, I, I've designed emergency communicator network trainings where we do this type of activity live in a, a team maybe of about 50 or so people and go out and do uh, uh, emergency response in the field and simulation. So it's kind of nice to see this all play out um, virtually. So I'm a technical officer at the World Health Organization. I specialize in risk communication. I'm primarily emergency risk communication um, and community engagement more and more. We br brought that in sort of to the realm of, of risk communication. So let me talk a little bit about how this plays in, because I think you're hearing a lot about infodemics and you're hearing a little bit about risk comms and community engagement if you've been paying at all attention to the COVID-19 response. So I'm gonna talk today about what these things are and how they really strongly link together. Um, I've done this work uh, globally in more than 40 countries uh, directly with ministries of health. So I can tell you the one thing is that we've seen a lot of commonality about needs during response, um, challenges, and ways to overcome those challenges. So if there's one thing I've learned in, in my career, it's that the more things seem different, the more they're actually kind of the same when it comes to people and trying to communicate with people. So I'm going to talk today about a couple of tried and true methodologies um, that you can apply in Elnor. Okay, so let me just go back a little bit in time so you understand the foundation of where risk communication came from and then how we've added in community engagement. Uh, the first time we've ever talked about risk communication was actually in the United States to address environmental hazards um, and how to explain those risks with the public in a way that helped them really make decisions about their own health and well being. Then they were taken into um, consideration during uh, global outbreaks and, and, and primarily during the SARS outbreak of around 2002 to 2004. Risk communication really came forward in the in the in the limelight because it was very much needed. We saw the the gap and transparency of communication with the population that was being affected, and it really needed to be brought forward as a, a primary um, arm of the response. So it was that at that point you be, you began to see it um, more spoken about in terms of the international health regulations, which are uh, the regulations that um, undergird or support global public health response. So risk communication, community engagement is one of the eight pillar areas of the international health regulations. So one of the primary response areas, side by side with surveillance, laboratory, and so on. So um, since the early days of about 2004, we've seen several guidelines that have been written, and these are all still available um, if you want to go back and see how they were used, how we approached planning efforts around risk communications. They were then integrated into the pandemic um, influence of preparedness response around 2009, applied more in the Ebola response responses of 2014 and then 2018, adding more a, a stronger element of community engagement. And then finally, um, there was a guidance document written in 2018, which reviewed um, uh, hundreds and hundreds of gray literature and um, published uh, papers around RCCE to really identify some gap areas in the response for risk communication. So these are all available online. And what I'm also gonna talk about towards the end of the presentation is the attributes of infodemics and how, what that's brought to the table and how that's enabled us to bridge a few gaps that were identified in this um, guidance document here. So a lot's happened in just a, a short period of time. So when we talk about risk communication and community engagement, what we're really talking about is a, a dialogue in real time where experts can communicate and hear back and forth two-way communication with those that are most affected um, during a response. And it's really to enable people to have the information that they need to be able to make decisions for their own health and well-being, that of their families and that of their communities. 
So the context is that any communication channel really needs to be using this. So we, so at one point it was often thought that risk communication was really only about mass media, but that's not the case. We're really talking about um, making sure that we have consistent messaging and approaches um, in, in communication spaces, spaces that people most trust and will look at during an emergency, but that we're saying using the same consistent messaging no matter what the channel. So whether it's social media, um, ensuring that the same messaging is heard from a doctor-patient relationship, um, bulletin boards, websites, uh, information and education materials, and through interpersonal communications as well. So we, so this is um, at the global level for WHO. It's not so easy. We have these sort of global messages. So we're really relying on our partnerships that um, get closer and closer uh, to the ground level, to the individuals, so that we can better ensure that the information we're providing at the global level echoes the messages that are being heard at the local level, because it's. Um, I'll talk about this in a minute, but it's when you have that disconnect between these messages, uh, that's where um, we can lose a bit of trust. And I'll talk about how important that is in the response in just a second. So during um, an emergency, um, and you know, emergency risk communications, often during emergency, we'll call it crisis communication, we're trying to bridge the public health context with the public context. And there's so many things that come into play here. And it, even if you just take COVID-19 right now, you're gonna see all of these things that we know are gonna happen during an emergency. So the event is urgent. So there's an urgent need for rapid information. That means there has to be rapid decision-making by the leaders to really understand what needs to be conveyed to the population. And why do we need that conveyed to the population so well? It's because if individuals don't know where they're at risk and they don't know um, what recommendations to follow or what they need to do, if they don't trust the messengers, they're not going to follow those recommendations. And then the issue is not going to be taken care of. I'll go into a little bit more examples um, in, in throughout my presentation. So there's um, often uh, in any emergency, a, a bit of uncertainty around science, and you can see this playing out more than ever in COVID-19. In fact, this, I, um, like I said earlier, I was designing a lot of these trainings prior to COVID-19, and I would have to write simulation exercises similar to the one that you're using right now. And I would have never, ever designed an exercise like COVID-19, because to be honest, it would have just seemed too unrealistic <laughs> prior to what's happening right now. So we're definitely seeing an uncertainty in science. This is a new disease. So while we're knowing, we're learning more and more about it every day, we still don't know everything. We don't know how it's going to play out. So that leaves a big space for uncertainty. So the changing of information as we go along has provided, um, I mean, is why we need uh, risk communication to be able to describe those changes to the population, those that need to react to them. There's lots of surprises and setbacks along the way. We're really relying on behavioral components to understand better how people are adapting to recommendations or how they're not. We're working with public anxiety and concern. Um, and then also there's extreme public reaction. You can see this playing out well with how people view masks and the politi politicization of mat the use of masks and the political context is coming into play uh, quite prevalently um, throughout the response as well. So when we think about um, our risk comms and community engagement and how they manage emergency challenges, we're dealing with uncertainty, um, uncertainty around science and what's going to happen next in terms of recommendations. We're also focusing on the public concern and what risk perception is um, by on, on the part of the public. Um, and we're also really trying to listen to the community. We're really trying to better understand what's going on, how recommendations are or are not being used within the community and what the underlying concerns are or where they're not concerned and, and they should be concerned. And finally, underlying all of this is trust. And trust is something that has to be built prior to an emergency and has to consistently be maintained. And, and it's something you have to consistently work at throughout an emergency. Because again, like I was saying earlier, if there's not trust um, on the part of responders and the individuals that are being affected, then the individuals 
are not going to listen to recommendations. They're not going to be willing to follow them. And then we're going to have a harder time um, mitigating and, and, and solving the issue. Okay, so let me start off with risk perception. And here's our first polling question. I think uh, Tina's going to help me out with that. It's uh, live and I will project it um, shortly. Here we go. Look, we already have some answers. Oh, wow. People are quick this morning. They've had their coffee. All right. So what is risk perception? Um, you can mark all that apply. Is it an assessment ah. by health? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, we're still waiting for people to vote. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I'll just uh, read out the answers, if that's okay. Um, yes. So your choices are uh, assessment by health and medical experts about the severity and the prev uh, wait, wait. Oh, wait, I see how this works. Never mind, I'm not gonna read out those responses. You can do this. And actually, I'm seeing that um, in this question, we did say mark all that apply, but actually there is one correct answer. So I apologize, Dean, if I um, sent that to you backwards, I'm afraid I may have. Uh, what I noticed was that uh, somehow the screen is uh, only showing a the first three responses. I'm gonna to try to reformat the screen so that we actually get to see all of them. Okay. It may be more informative. Um, it looks that. like the top choices are being pushed to the top maybe. Yes, um, but we do have, uh, uh, there's one response that's here. Uh, can you see all of them? Uh, yes. Perfect, Wait, sorry about we? that. It's okay. By the way, pro tip for those of you using Slido, you can also pull up slido.com and enter hashtag unicorn on your phone. So you don't need to switch between tabs or different windows on your desktop if you're watching Zoom on your computer. Um, that's another fast way to be able to, to, to um, vote um, and to, to take survey questions. Okay, are we about there? Have a yeah, bit. we have about... Uh... 60, 65% of uh, people voting. So I would suggest to, to go ahead. Okay, great. Um, so apologies. Um, this one actually did have one clear answer. Um, and that is, <laughs> as soon as I say it, everybody will vote for it. So it's the third thing that's on the list here right now, individual assessment about the possibility of harm to one's livelihood or Oh, shoot. I just uh, lost. Ah, sorry. Uh, or the local economy. Um, so what it is, is it's really, it, it, it's uh, risk perception is based on the individual. Um, so that's the difference between the one that seems to be um, highest choice here. So it really is an, an individual assessment about the possibility of harm. And when you think about COVID, what we're talking about is the possibility of harm, both with um, potentially um, contracting the disease, but also the effects of that and also the external effects of the pandemic, sort of what is the harm to uh, one's livelihood or the local local economy. So risk perception is the individual assessment about harm that could um, be caused. And this is critically important uh, to the work that we're doing in, in risk communication. Okay, so should I go back to the, can I go back to my slide presentation, Tina? Yes, so go ahead and click the share screen again and it will okay. allow you to share again. Okay, are we there? Great. Oh, I see. I messed that up. Okay. Um, all right. 
just give me this moment. Uh, all right. So, so risk perception is really critically important when we're working uh, with with risk communication and, and community engagement, because it, it, it without that information about what individuals view as their risk, we're really kind of flying blind when it comes to communication. We don't know if people are actually really concerned about an issue. If they are. How are they concerned? How much are they concerned? Um, are, are, do they understand how it affects their lives? And so on. So um, what we're looking for are things like overreaction or underreaction. So let me go to that next. So if we take this chart as an example, the center point we can think of is in terms of how um, expert recommendations could come in line with the public perception of a risk. And this is always an issue because we as public health experts view the risk and uh, around a public health event quite differently than the public does. Uh, different things come into play. We look at it as a very scientific way. How many people are affected? Who's affected? To what degree are they affected? Um, how much harm can come to them, whereas individuals are looking at it quite differently. Um, so it's important that we kind of align our communications and our communication response to help match the expert view with the public view. So the, if we look at this, the target being where we've matched or we've aligned these things perfectly, people, um, individuals plot themselves around um, this target a little differently. So individuals may be overly cautious, where they perceive a very high level of risk. And that can be um, kind of dangerous because they may be afraid, too afraid to participate in low risk but important things like uh, going for routine medical appointments, routine vaccination. They may be concerned about um, seeking care uh, just for, in this case, non-COVID related issues. Or they may be at the other extreme where they're overly fatalistic or over, um, overwhelmed and overly fatalistic, uh, and they perceive a, a high level of risk, but a low confidence um, in their solutions to address those risks. And then those, there are those that are under concerned. They perceive that they have a very low level of risk, um, and they're very optimistic, they're biased in that way, or they may just have what we're kind of um, very much generalizing in terms of pandemic fa fatigue. And there's a range of emotions around here. So I'm, not, and I'm not gonna go down that <laughs> pandemic fatigue uh, path because there's a lot of ways we can kind of be looking at this, but they just may be kind of a bit over the whole situation. So if you know where your audience uh, and people that you're trying to reach are concerned, it better helps you develop your communication. So you can see a range here at the bottom where those are overly cautious can, that can kind of lead to harmful action. Whereas those on the right-hand side of the screen that are overwhelmed, fatalistic or under concern can lead to no action at all. So um, it, it's really relying on the way we can uh, communicate with them to, to help balance this. So, um, so explaining the science um, doesn't necessarily always influence risk perception. And the reason is, if you put the public on one side, they're asking questions and they're concerned about how catastrophic are the individual outcomes to this. Do they have control over a situation or is it controlled by others? Um, is, is there permanent or temporary harm? Um, are there, is there voluntary or involuntary exposure? All these things make it seem very, very unfair to the public. Um, and there's different ways to, to, to address this. So it's a very emotional, emotional and contextual way of looking at a particular emergency. Whereas those of us who are scientists and technical experts, we, we look at it more in terms of the cognitive dimension where we're looking at things like severity and prevalence of disease. And we're not really thinking about how individuals are affected and maybe viewing this in terms of, is it familiar or is it novel? Is it fair or not fair? Is it affecting those we consider to be universally vulnerable like children, pregnant women, and so on? All of these things uh, become really critically important when it comes to communication. So um, when it comes to risk comms and uh, community engage engagement messaging, uh, influencing risk perception, um, it helps 
to influence behavior. So when we want to overcome the optimism bias, those were the individuals that were on the right-hand side of the screen of the diagram I showed you earlier, uh, we want to increase that by uh, the salience of the disease. For example, we want to emphasize identifiable victims, so to speak, um, in messages and stories. So it helps um, pull people out of into realizing that people like them can be affected. So people like me, this could affect me and help them realize the severity of the issue. We also need to tailor messaging to the local situation, right? We see this more than ever in COVID-19 where it's um, affected our globe, but it's affected countries and communities at different rates and at different times and in different ways. So it's more important now than ever that we tailor messaging and information to the local situation, which means we need to know what that local situation is. Now, for those who were overly concerned and fatalistic, um, we need to build um, confidence and self-efficacy around what they can do. We need to make messages actionable, um, show people that they can, uh, describe steps that they can do in their lives to help address the issues, um, and highlight actions that authorities and partners are already doing to control the issue so that they know that there's an infrastructure that knows what they're doing and is working behind the scenes to help, help um, protect their health. Um, okay, so with that now, I'm going to move from risk perception, which is, a, you know, the underlying um, issues that we need to know about in order to, in order to better communicate uh, with our populations to managing a critical point, which is uncertainty. So uncertainty um, is, is, is a huge element of risk communication. Um, and it's always, I mean, if there's one certainty about public health emergencies, it's that there will be uncertainty. Um, so common areas of uncertainty are always around what was the cause of the issue, what's the scope of harm, who's going to be affected, how much are they going to be affected, who are the at-risk groups, uh, what interventions, what vaccine, what therapeutics are there available right now, um, and then what are going to be the overarching, or overarching uh, outcomes related to this health threat. And there are also three kinds of uncertainty. Um, in messaging, um, oops, sorry, uh, you know, there's messaging, there's uncertainty about the actual unknowns of the issue. And there are a lot of those in COVID-19. Um, you know, at first we really didn't know how the disease was spread. Um, and even today, we don't know a lot of things about the, the, the effect on individuals who's um, affected the most and so on. We do know a lot more than we knew um, several months ago. This can sometimes lead to conflicting messages, which is another area of, um, of uncertainty. And you can see how this is playing out too in different parts of the world are saying slightly different things about, um, uh, about messaging around COVID-19. And even different public health agencies are saying slightly different things too. Um, and, and it's just because of the context of, of where they need the individuals individuals they need to communicate with. And also um, uncertainty can be found in the context of multiple uncertainties. And again, COVID-19 shows this economic, social uncertainties and so on as this affects more than just our, our public's health. So I have the next polling question. And that is what are the co what causes the most confusion in your area? Um, and if you could choose the single most relevant answer here. So Tina, that's back to you for the polling. We already have 103 votes, Mindy. So how'd that happen? <laughs> um, people have, I actually didn't activate it, but people have been really fast. <laughs> ah, great. Okay. So it looks like the, oh, overwhelming lead here is when various organizations providing conflicting information or when they provide conflicting information or recommendations about COVID-19. Uh, second in line is when government changes recommendations and guidance over time. Uh, and then when people hear different recommendations that apply in different locations and so on. So all of these things and, and then when governments communicate about what is still unknown about regarding COVID-19. So yes, all of these things are, are, are issues and um, create a, a feeling of uh, a, a confusion um, throughout the, the response. 
Okay, so I'll go back to my presentation again. Okay. Good. Are we seeing this now? All good. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, okay. And yeah, so all of these things come into play. And I think the, it's, this, it's been difficult. I mean, this is really um, proven that among the hugest challenges, um, and again, in any public health emergency, but you could just see it playing out in hyperspeed and globally through COVID-19 and all of these issues have happened that create um, a feeling of uncertainty uh, and confusion among the population. So it, it really helps, um, I mean, it helps better define why we need emergency risk communication to help address some of these things. And so after about 10 months in COVID-19, we still see a lot of uncertainties um, in our press. And here are some examples here. And we still don't know a lot. Um, when is it gonna be safe to and give my friend a hug? When will there be a vaccine? Uh, where is it safe to travel now? Um, when is this gonna be over? Uh, how long can COVID-19 affect people? How many people will ultimately, unfortunately pass um, from COVID-19? Will it mutate? When can my children go back to school? How long before I can travel? Are there treatments? So many unknowns around this, many questions that these are the ones that we're most commonly um, hearing and seeing throughout our work. So um, when it comes to messaging, uh, transparency and consistency are really key. So um, some of the goals here are to be direct and explicit about public communication and, and really define uncertainty. It's, it's okay to say things like, listen, we, there are a lot of unknowns here. Here's basically what we know. Here's what we don't know. But you know what? Here's what we're doing to find out. Um, with that transparency, um, it, it's been shown that people actually trust their um, responders more when they're clear about the fact that the you know, there are a lot of unknowns and still a lot of uncertainty. Um, and, and, and so it's important as communicators to, to openly say this, to openly describe how much uncertainty there is around a, um, um, a, a certain event and really to kind of set expectations in the minds of, of the audience and the people and the population that there will be change. Um, information really has to be consistent. That means um, that messaging, even though it may change over time, has to be consistently shared among different channels. So this is what we're saying right now, make sure that there aren't too many uh, disconnects with what's being said. Um, and, and also consistency among sources too. This has proven to be a big challenge and you can see this playing out with uh, the infodemic. Um, and any discrepancies need to be explained. I think maybe one of the most common one that you were hearing was uh, maybe the, the proper distance about um, physical distancing. Is it one meter or is it six feet <laughs> as was used in the United States? So again, very contextual um, why, why WHO recommended something compared to say US CDC. And, and when you don't have the answer to be transparency about how, to be transparent about how decisions are made, because again, we don't have all the answers and it would be foolish to say that we did or to try to provide an answer when we don't know it. So it's important to be transparent about what we know, what we don't know, but talk about how decisions are being made. And if you can see that this has happened in the WHO communications where we talk about the, the groups of global scientists that are coming together to help inform decisions that are being made about infection prevention and control, clinical care, and so on. Um, and, and, and then it's important to, you know, again, describe how decisions are being made in the context of uncertainty. And here's an example uh, from uh, Italy's um, Lombardy region where there was a prison population. So uh, the doctor that was in charge of this, and in this situation of uncertainty, we explored all the ideas we had to tackle um, in the potential uh, for a potential outbreak in the prison system. We amended checklists almost every day to find the right way to operate. So here was a very transparent message about how the issue was dealt with because there were so many unknowns and how the decision got made uh, to, to, and the approach of this. 
Okay, so I mentioned earlier that the, the basis behind all of this is really the goal is to establish and maintain trust throughout the response. So the messenger matters when it comes to trust. Um, I said the, over, you know, the overriding goal in outbreak communications, risk communications, is always to build this trust among the public. Um, positive outcomes of this is that there'll be increased um, health protective behaviors. Practice will be, um, uh, will be adopted by more people. Higher levels of risk message acceptance. So the more trust there is, the more apt people will follow, again, follow the recommendations and make the changes in recommendations as they're being made. Um, they'll be more apt to, to, to participate in preparedness activities and um, you know, things that will matter coming up like vaccine acceptance and so on. So when it comes to the risk uh, messenger, individuals are looking for certain things. So the risk messenger can be any number of, of individuals. It could be a, a national government. It could be a, um, a local health department. It can be a, a physician, a doctor, a nurse. Um, or so on. So people are looking at things um, when they're determining trust in the message. They're looking at skills and, and that comes into play. Like there's people are asking to themselves, are risk managers, is this person competent or is this, this um, response body competent? Are, do they agree with other experts or are they outstanding? Or is the rec are the recommendations different than what I'm hearing from other organizations around the world or in my country. They're also, um, the population or individuals are asking about the motives when they think about trust in public health messaging. They're, at, they're saying to themselves, um, are these individuals acting to safeguard my health and well being? Do they care about me? And did they, they're also asking about the empathy involved with the messenger, those that are responsible for the response. Do they understand, respect, and care about me and my concerns? Are they looking at it from my perspective or are they acting to take care of their own needs? And you can see, think of a couple of examples where the public has mistrusted uh, the messenger or the response organization because they don't think that that, that response entity is necessarily um, concerned about their own health and well-being. And then also the integrity of the risk managers. Are they telling the truth and are they reliable? And then finally, um, are these risk managers part of my community? Do they understand the way we live, the things we do every day? Do they share our values? Um, are they gonna share the burden and the consequences of the advice they gave me? Or are they so distant from where I am and what I'm, what my life is like, are they not going to be there when I need them? So having that pre-established relationship um, and trust even prior to an emergency is sort of the best, best way forward. So when we think about um, trust through messaging, um, we have to always link it to accessible services. Again, we're acknowledging that uncertainty. So that helps to gain um, the trust and, and, and hold people into the, the um, continuing line of the response. Uh, we wanna make sure that our messaging is coordinated and consistent with other responders. So if you're working in a country, and we've done a lot of work around this, and you're the Ministry of Health, you wanna make sure that your messaging stays consistent with the hospitals, uh, with the local health authorities, with the emergency responders, which are often uh, working in a different, maybe a, a, probably a different sphere from public health authorities. Um, and then you have the, the governing body as well. So you just wanna make sure that the messaging is coordinated and consistent with all of these responders. And of course, the, I, the issue of transparency that I mentioned earlier. You also wanna link your messaging to self-efficacy. You can do this, you can be in control of this. These are ways that you can you know, adopt to these, these things to your life today. Um, and you want to make it very easy to understand. There's a lot of health literacy here, hitting it at the right level. And then avoid rapid changes. That's a little difficult in this context, but anything that you see coming up, begin to message around that, begin to sort of message ahead and understand what's coming up. So you're not doing these drastic changes in your messaging, but rather leading people into different concepts. And again, talking about uncertainty so people can expect changes. Make sure it's timely. 
Um, whenever you have something new to share, share it as soon as possible. Because with today in social media, that information is going to get out faster than you can get it out as a, respond, a response organization. So it's just important to keep on top of the messaging and changing as quickly as possible and use multiple channels. Don't expect that everybody's looking at a Ministry of Public Health website. That's not the case. <laughs> they're looking at their own social media. They're looking at channels that they already trusted prior to the emergency. So ensure that your messaging gets to where people are gonna look naturally for their trusted information. And then again, establish that dialogue so that you understand more about people's risk perceptions, what their daily lives are like, where they're coming from, so that you can better tailor your information and your engagement activities for what they need. Okay, so let's go on to that quickly. And I know we have a timeline here. Um, so, so the other part of risk communication, RCCE, is the CE, which is community engagement. And this has come more into play over the past couple of years, particularly when we were really responding to the Ebola outbreaks that really, really, really needed um, less sort of messaging around risk and, and messaging coming uh, from within a response body. And it really became um, so critically important uh, to work with the community and better understand their needs. So we can describe community engagement in any number of ways. So I wanna hear from you. So maybe throughout this portion of my presentation, if you just wanna kind of enter in a couple of things into the chat or whatever in the world you're using there, go ahead and just give me your ideas and I'll, I'll continue and we'll kind of check back with you in a minute or two. So community engagement really is, is focusing on listening. This is the listening part of, of um, the work that we do. And we know that um, it, it, we really have to do a lot of research and understand uh, methods. And now we need these more than ever that, that may not be in-person ways of doing community engagement, but rather other ways to really understand people's awareness of an issue, their knowledge, underlying knowledge about the, the public health issue, COVID-19 today, um, and their attitudes around it, what actions they're taking, and then again, to understand the circulating rumors and misinformation, just like what we've been talking about with infodemics. And there's no best way for doing listening, but there are lots of good options. So here is the table that just kind of helps um, give you a couple ideas about how to gather data on beliefs, attitudes, behaviors, and concerns. And um, you know, they're listed there, you can read them. And I think it's interesting as this was probably written more for like a face-to-face -face type concept, traditional community engagement, but it'll be great to kind of begin to see how we can do these more virtually these days as well. I mean, there's no getting away from the fact that face-to-face -face and really using individuals that are embedded in communities are the best, but we're also looking at new and different ways to, to gather this information and better understand the communities we're looking at. Um, these are just a couple of um, examples from Ebola, which was a very different situation, of course, than COVID-19, but really, really proved the need, again, for um, need to understand and work with communities. Um, and here's just a, a great quote from one of our partners in Internews. When dealing with complex issues like Ebola, you have to start with what information is most critical to the local population, not with what you need them to know. So it's important to know that kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier when I was talking about, you know, the differences between what the public's perception of an emergency is and what the local population or the people most affected, what their perception is. So um, here are a couple of benefits of community engagements um, and listening. So um, we're, and we're trying to really highlight this more than ever that as emergency responses are going on, we really need to bring, be bringing in communities more and more into the effort because if it's not working, if it's not resonating, some of these public health and social measures that we're recommending now, if it's not gonna be work within a, a community, it's not gonna happen. And we're only gonna know if something's gonna work within a community um, if they're part of the process. So more and more, we're really trying to make sure that the communities are linked into their emergency response systems in countries and in at subnational levels as well. Okay, um, here's another uh, example um, from Ebola, the ambulance project that um, we're uh, roving ambulances were used um, and, and sent around to do more community engagement and so on. 
Um, but I think even during COVID-19, we can begin to redefine sort of what a community is. Is it a physical community that you work one-on-one -on -one with that really requires um, a, a member of that community to be able to better communicate and work with them? Meaning somebody who lives and is part of that town and part of that community? Or are we talking about sort of a different idea of a community, which is a bit more virtual? Here's a screenshot of something we did, I don't know, a couple of days ago, actually. And it's a, a, a youth um, design lab. So here's a community of people that are all, you know, have their similarities or community of young people. You can maybe exclude me in that <laughs> scenario. But again, it, they have a lot of commonalities, although it's not geographically focused. Um, so again, this is really helping us think in terms of different ways to consider community. All right, so whoops, you answered, um, I think, gave maybe some advice or ideas in the chat room about what a community is. Maybe if I could ask Tina to read out a couple of them. Absolutely. Uh, we got over 35 submissions, so I, I'll just do some picks uh, for you. Yeah. Uh, one is, uh, one response was, uh, it's a two-way communication, listening to identify gaps and how communities prefer to receive information. Mm -hmm. The other one is involving community in decision-making by listening to them and analyze their concerns and suggested solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one is community engagement is connecting community altogether to be concerned on a particular issue. Uh, and maybe the last one, involving community in health promotion, listening from community regarding their concerns. Okay, great. Um, thank you for, for, for submitting some um, ideas here. And I think you can probably see what you said reflected exactly in the slides. So it helps to facilitate decision-making at the local level. Uh, let's see, it helps working with the community members to tailor and localize health messaging and empowering community members to, to, to do this work as well and encouraging uh, communities to be part of the solution um, as well. So, so thanks for this. This is a really important topic. And in this, this aspect um, is really, I think we'll have a lot of research done around this um, after we get a bit more through COVID. So I just wanted to hear touch on the fact that when we're talking about infodemic management and community engagement, we've, we're, we're trying to bridge this sort of physical world. You know, some of the images and I, uh, examples I used from Ebola to more of the virtual world, but they all are listening, meant to con, uh, listen to concerns, communicate risk and translate science, promote resilience um, to, well, to misinformation and engage and empower these different communities. So I think this, it's gonna be interesting to see how this goes along in terms of the physical and the virtual world and how, how much this interplays. I mean, even if we just talk about misinformation, misinformation doesn't start in social media. It starts <laughs> at communities and with individuals first and then makes its way to social media. So if we were talking about communities and individuals and use of misinformation, it's almost like we need to start uh, with the individual and communities themselves you know, rather than the social media, one grows from the other. So, you know, that leaves a lot of room for research in the future. Um, okay, so lastly, just to bridge this idea of infodemics um, and, and risk communication and community engagement, um, I've often really described infodemics as sort of being like uh, risk communication on steroids in a way. I mean, it really has brought light a, a, a lot of, um, sort of we're using the same concepts to address infodemics um, that we've always used in risk comms and community engagement, but it's given a lot of us a better understanding around some certain issues that I've mentioned earlier. So one, one aspect is around the idea of uncertainty. So, um, so, so we met, I mentioned earlier that we always explicitly need to acknowledge uncertainty. And I think it's more important now um, that it's linked to a positive um, a consideration of transparency is linked to trust uh, through epidemiology. Um, and what is this added? So it's, uh, it's uncertainties um, there, it's, it's sort of uh, in a way led to uh, more susceptibility to conspiracy th uh, theories. People are, are drawn to these theories because there's a lot of uncertainty. So it's um, this gap and uncertainties has led to, to some issues. 
Um, and, and then it's um, epidemiology in a way is helping us um, better make sense of in an uncertain world um, and so on. Um, also, epidemiology is added to our understanding of what the community is. So I mentioned that a little bit earlier, sort of the physical world versus the virtual world. Um, so, you know, one of the challenges of RCC research and community engagement is the lack of a single definition around community. Um, so, so it could be that groups who are shared a residence uh, in a same physical geographic community or share the same role like professionals or volunteers or job categories or so, so on, or individuals who just share a particular interest or political ideology. So some of the ex, um, example, like I gave in the youth network, the common thread there that people are all around the same um, age. And in that case, we're, we're really interested in being, um, uh, we're really interested in being uh, active in this area. So what is it added? Um, uh, network mapping, it's better helped us to define some online communities um, and, and how they're structured and how they relate to other communities. And this has also shown us uh, what specific messages um, um, can be uh, more uh, readily heard or adopted or shared by these different communities too. So it's really given us a better visual on how communication flows through these different communities. And it's also adding a lot to our knowledge about social media. So when we always said risk comms and community engagement employs channels that are trusted um, by at-risk communities, um, infodemiology has really added um, more information behind who's using this, how they're using it, um, and the social validation on, on using social media. And it's also highlighted the mix of content on social media for what's accurate um, and what is what's more relevant to individuals and so on. So it's giving us just a, a clear insight into what's, what's going on, how information is being used um, and, and how it's being shared and so on. So these kind of things we were a bit blind to um, prior to the sort of introduction of epidemics management. So it's been an excellent tool in our toolbox um, uh, using risk communication. And on the flip side, you can see in this ish area of infodemiology, how risk comes becomes, it's sort of just the same response patterns um, with sort of a 